Hosanna, I greet you in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you for making the time <coughs> and the fellowship. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for coming. We haven't seen you in a while. Uh, I thought maybe I, I'd said something wrong that hurt you. But I'm pleased that you are here with us. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, but let's continue uh, uh, and not waste any time and continue on the service that we started. And as I said, Bazan, we are building a case for grace. You know, in my mind, when, I, when I'm trying to put this message across, and I know some things I'm repeating, but I'm saying them because I want this to get in and settle in our hearts. Hallelujah, Bazan. Um, and we are taking step by step. We are not rushing because I believe this is one of the key things that when we fully understand, it will allow us to walk in greater victory in our lives. Hallelujah, Amen. When we understand the message of grace and the beauty of what the Lord, our, our Savior, Jesus Christ, has brought for us at Calvary, Bazalan. Hallelujah. Amen. So when we are making a case, we are we're actually trying to build a case to say, you know, grace is necessary. There actually is no other way except for grace. And that's the case that we are trying to build. We are trying to convict the brethren that all of us, all of us need grace. Hallelujah, Amen. Um, And I'm just going to repeat a few things that we said so that, you know, as I said, just to remind ourselves where we started. We said grace is necessary because we can't in our own, way, in our own self make ourselves righteous, Bazalan. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm hoping that that is starting to settle in our lives. That through our own efforts, it is impossible for us to make ourselves righteous. Because one way or the other, we will trip. And when we trip, we become unrighteous. Holiness, Bazan, is pure. Holiness is purity. It's got nothing, no stains in there, Bazan. And therefore, through our own efforts, one way or the other, we will fall. And I, I think something that we also fail to see is that we, we think that we became sinners because we have sinned. And we fail to see that it is not because we have sinned that we become sinners. Hallelujah, mm -hmm. That is often the mistake that we make. We think that we are sinners because we have sinned. We don't realize that we sin because we are sinners. Does that make sense, Amen. Or Let's go to the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 12. You know, we're reading the book of Romans, Baza, and I'm hoping that you are seeing this thing about grace and about this righteousness that comes through faith, Baza. In the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 12, let's just emphasize this fact that we are not sinners because we have sinned. But we sin because we are sinners. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. How did they all sin, Bazala? They all sinned through one man. Hence, I'm making the point you don't see. But the reason why you sin is because you are a sinner. The sin doesn't make you a sinner. You are already a sinner before you even sin. Am I making sense? Is, or is that hard for you to accept? <laughs> Maybe that's why. You are a sinner. Before you sin, you are a sinner. Because of what? Because sin entered through one man. Are you with me, Bazaar? How did, how did they sin? Because they sinned in Adam. Hallelujah, Baza. Amen. And then let's read the verse 18. What does verse 18 say in the same book? Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. So through one man's offense, judgment came to how many? All men. Is that what is that what the Bible says? Amen. Through one man's offense, judgment came to how many? Sounds not fair. <laughs> Through one man's act, judgment came to all men. You see, this is the thing, Bazaar. You did not make yourself a sinner 
That is why you can't make yourself righteous. Are you with me, Brother? You did not make yourself a sin, and that is why it is impossible for you, through your own efforts, to make yourself righteous, to meet God's standard of righteousness. Because I've said to you, God's standard of righteousness is one who has never sinned, who is not sinning, and who will never sin. One who is perfect. Can you say you are that one? You don't want to say it, never say You don't want to respond. I know. You don't have to answer. <laughs> I know the answer. How do you have that? So this is the problem, Mazalan, is that we don't make ourselves sinners. Therefore, we can't make ourselves. And you know, when I was, as I'm preparing this, the Holy Spirit is, keeps on saying to me, <coughs> you know, this message of grace and what Christ has done is more harder to accept for people who've been walking in the works of the law than people who are sinners. Are you with me, Mazalan? And I'll try and show you as we go through. It's hard for Abba who have been walking this journey for a long time to accept this message more than people who are in sin. Hallelujah, Abba Let's continue, Abba And you see, generally as Christians, most of us, most of us here, we generally accept that we need salvation to be saved. Is that correct, Abba We generally accept that we need salvation from Christ to be saved. And then as soon as we, re we receive salvation, you know what we do? Then we say we must maintain that salvation through our own efforts. Is that not the case, Abba That's what we should... Abba talk to me, Abba Is what I'm saying true or not, Abba We accept that in order to be saved, we need salvation. But as soon as we are saved, we believe that through our own efforts, we must maintain our salvation. That's what we believe. Is that not the case, Pastor? Yeah, yeah. yeah Pastor, I don't want to say it. Okay. Yeah. It's fine. I'll assume that what I'm saying is right. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'll assume that what I'm saying is right, Pastor. Pastor, can we accept, Pastor, that there is now a righteousness that comes from faith. Is that something that we can accept? Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to verse 22. Can we accept that word that comes from the Lord, Pazan? Just read it for us. <clears throat> but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith is Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the grace and show and fall short of the glory of God. Bazan, when you read verse 21, and verse 21 says, but now, when is now, Bazan? No. Not in the past, no, Bazan. No. When is now? No. Now is present tense. Yeah. No? It says, but now, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. How do you understand this verse, Basel? Can you please read in other translations, Basel? The different translations that we have. Can we just read verse 21? But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is God no is distinction. Different. Yes. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. I want verse 21 in other translation, Pastor. Let's read it. What does it say? But now the righteousness of God, <clears throat> apart from law, has been made known, through which the law and the prophets testify. Yes. What do other translations say? I know there are other translations. Read, mm. Does anyone have New Living Translation? Does anyone have Good News Bible? Can we? Just, I want us to read, Baza, because I want you this verse to sink in our heads, in our spirits. What the word is saying. But now God has shown us a way to. 
Translation is saying yeah. God has revealed a way Amen. of us being righteous without keeping the requirements of them. I'm asking you that can you accept that there is now a righteousness that comes from faith in Jesus Christ? Because I submit, we all say, Jesus, I need you, I need you to save me. But as soon as He saves you, you say, Now I must maintain my you know what we are saying. You are saying, Jesus, your work is not finished. I need to finish your work for you. Are you with me, sir? Amen. This is, I know this is tough. You are thinking of, and you are thinking, I know it's tough. <laughs> it's tough to accept the goodness of the Lord. Can you imagine that? Someone is being good to us, but it's tough for us to accept it. Bazaran, this is what... That's why I'm saying it's easier for someone. If I spoke to someone who had never heard this message and I said, you know, this is what God has done for you. It would be easier for them to accept other than us who've been taught that we must keep the requirements of the law. It's because we've been taught this all of these years, Baza. And I still maintain, I'm not giving you a license to sin. I will show you what this message of grace says and how it deals with the issue of sin. I'm just saying that once you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the work is finished, Pastor. And I know you're not going to give me an amen, but I'm going to say amen for myself. <laughs> when, when Jesus Christ died on the cross and he said it is finished, he meant every single word that he said when he said it is finished. Now, the second thing that we said, Pastor, makes a case for, a case for grace is that when you try and say, I'm going to save myself, we said it's a form of spiritual pride. I'm going to save myself. Then you become like the man that we spoke about last week, but we'll get there. And then you forget that in the book, in the same book of Romans chapter 3, when you read verse 20, it says through the works of the law, no man shall be justified before God. So it means you can do all the works you want to do in terms of the law. You will get no justification before God. I, I will not read in the Bible, person. No, maybe read 320 times, just read it for us. So that you don't say our pastor says this. No, you must say the Bible says this. Read it for us. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin what what this verse is saying is that the reason why the law was given is so that we know what sin is Amen. but as far as you keeping the law you've got a big problem you've got a major problem of keeping the law because there's a seed that is at work in you that makes you to sin even when you don't want to sin today we are reading Romans chapter 7 verse Please be, be faithful and read chapter 7 of Romans. And you'll hear the struggles that Paul is going through. Where he says, me in my mind, I delight in the law of the Lord. I love God's law. And, and the thing that I try to do, which is the law, I don't do. But it's the thing that I don't want to do that I find myself doing. And he said, what a wretched man. I, please read that chapter as well and see what his solution is to his problem. Amen. You will see that he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Because it is Jesus Christ that deals with the problem of sin on our behalf. Hallelujah, Bazaar. You know, this issue of self-righteousness, we looked at Bazaar last week when we were reading the book of Luke chapter 18. We saw two men coming to the prayer table. One came to the Lord bringing his works of righteousness and the other one came seeking for mercy. But then can you imagine this? Two people come to God in prayer. One brings their works of righteousness. 
to justify himself before God. The other one who is a sinner comes seeking for mercy. The Bible says only one man left justified. Who left, was left justified was that? The one who was seeking for mercy. Because through the works of the flesh, through the works of the law, no flesh, no man shall be justified. So even if he did all of these great things, I tithe, I don't lie, I don't do all these things like this other man. The Bible says one of them went justified. You know why? Because the one was trusting in the mercy of God while the other was trusting in their own works. It's a form of self-righteousness. And then we said instead we need to have a different outlook where we see God loving us more than we see ourselves loving God. Are we together or something? Mm -hmm. This is where I want to, to build uh, the sermon for today. We started by looking at Peter. We compared Peter with John. Peter's name is rock, represents the law. John's name represents the graciousness or the grace of God. We saw that, Bazan. I mean, we saw the disciple who loves Jesus, who made a claim that they love Jesus. We saw where he was when the dust settled. When we compared him to the one who said, I am loved by Jesus. When all was said and done, the one who was claiming that I love Jesus, I do things for Jesus, had run away. He had cursed people and run away. And yet the one who had said, Lord, the Lord loves me, was at the foot of the cross when Jesus was being crucified. Hallelujah, Bazaran. So Bazaran, just like in, in Luke chapter 2, it's almost like one was seeking to show his love for Jesus and the other came seeking to be loved by Jesus. Hallelujah, Bazaran. Amen. Now, I want to share something with you, Bazaran, that happened in my life that is similar to what happened to Peter. Peter was a zealous man. Peter was a man that loved God. And when I got saved, when I became a new creation in Christ, when I received Christ back in the year 1999, I was on fire for the Lord. I was, a, I was a youth member who was on fire for the Lord and I was zealous for the Lord. We used to attend all meetings. We in the youth together with my wife. She used to, you never used to miss a meeting. You used to attend Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, on fire for the Lord. But even when I was on fire for the Lord, something would happen. I would find myself struggling with sin. Are you with me, Bazaar? In my zeal for the Lord, I'd find myself struggling with sin. And I distinctly remember at one time, I think I had done this sin maybe for the 11th time or something like that. You know, I remember making a prayer to God. You know what I said to God? Here's, here's a prayer from a young man praying to God when he's in sin. You know what I said to God? I said, Father, the next time I commit this sin, please kill me. Are you with that, that, that just shows how zealous I was and how sincere I was in my effort to show God how much I love him. I made this prayer. Father, if, it means I don't deserve you. You must kill me. And then I sinned for the 12th time. And the 13th time. And thank God for his mercy. Because he didn't kill me. <laughs> he saw this stupid young man. <laughs> and he was merciful to me, Basara. But I, I was on fire and I was saying, Lord, I want to, I, I'm, I love you, Lord. I want to do everything you want me to do. I'm even prepared to die. Are you with Basara? Mm -hmm. That's how serious I was about dealing with the issue of sin in my life. And yet I found another law at work in my members, just like Paul. Are you with me, Basara? Amen. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was until the mercy, uh, until I realized the love of God for me, that things started to change, Bazaar. Can you imagine making that kind of a prayer, Bazaar? You know what the problem was, Bazaar? Let me tell you what the problem was. 
when I got born again, everything that I was taught, I was taught what to do and I was taught what not to do. No one ever told me how much God loved me. Now, you know what I was trying to do? Remember, Bazar, the church is depicted as the bride of Christ. Right, Bazar? So when, when Christ comes to you, he's actually supposed to court you with his love. Are you with me, Bazar? He's supposed to win you over with his love. So instead, what was happening? I was trying to love someone I did not know. Bazar, is that, am I making sense? Because I, I, was, I was told if, if I don't become saved, I'm going to die and I'm going to go to hell. And sometimes you get saved because you're afraid and you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then the next thing they tell the do's and don'ts of Christianity. And yet you are supposed to, and I said, I love the Lord. I was trying to love someone I did not know. Someone first needed to convince me of how much God loved me. And yet I found myself with a lot of rules of what to do and what not to do. And I had no way of knowing how to deal with these rules that I was given. And I was finding myself condemned. That's why I was even making these kinds of prayers. Save Basada. And yet I was saying to the Lord, kill me. Hallelujah, Basada. There's something that I failed to understand, Basada. And I want us to read the book of 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. And I think this is where we often miss it as a church. We want to demonstrate our love for God without us seeing the love of God first in our lives. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. What's that? Do you hear that verse, Pastor? Just read that again. We love him because he first loved us. The, in other words, what the Bible is saying is the only way you can love God is if you recognize that he loved you first. How do you love someone that you don't know? How do you love someone that you don't know what their beliefs are? We love God because he loved mm -hmm. us first, Pastor. So we've got to recognize his love for us first. And when you recognize his love for you, it starts to change you. It starts to do certain things in you, Basara. You know what was happening to me as a young man? I was making the same mistake that Judas Iscariot was doing. And I will show you what I'm trying to say. To deal with my guilt, I wanted to sacrifice my own life. Are you with Basara? Look at what Judas Iscariot did. Matthew chapter 27. After he had betrayed Jesus. I want you to see what he did. Matthew chapter 27. Verse 3 to 5. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had, he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver of the chief priests and elders. Okay, just hold it there for a while. I want you to understand, Bazan, because sometimes you go past through this very fast and not necessarily appreciate what is happening here. The Bible says, then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful, Bazan. He was genuinely remorseful. In other words, he was repenting. He was regretting what he had done with Judas. And in his repentance, Basala, and he brought back the 30 pieces of silver of the chief priests and the elders. So he's saying, I realize that what I've done is so wrong. I can't even eat this money. That's a man who's genuinely remorseful, Basala. He's not just, he's not just paying lip service. He is genuinely repentant, this person. He even goes to them and he wants to give them the money because he's truly repentant. Like most of us are, we, we are truly repentant. And then what does it do? Verse 4 to verse 5. Saying I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. 
Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Here is a man who has done wrong. And after he has done wrong, he is truly, truly repentant. And he's, in his repentance, he is genuine. But the problem with his genuine repentance is that it's got self-righteousness attached to it. Because he then goes and he hangs himself. Bazali, do you understand? Do you understand, Bazali? Do you understand this? The ultimate price of self-righteousness is suicide. Does that make sense to you, Bazali? Because you are saying no one else can save me except myself. So in order to deal with this problem, the only person that can deal with this problem is by taking the ultimate sacrifice, which is my life. The ultimate, ultimate, ultimate Bazaar, price of self-righteousness is suicide. When you go and you kill yourself because you've done wrong, you are saying that the only thing that can solve this problem is if I give my life. And how wrong he was. You know, what he, what he needed to do, he needed to do the same thing that had he waited for three days, he would have realized that Christ had been raised from the dead. Just like Peter. Peter was also in the same problem. But Christ waited for the grace that comes from Jesus Christ. And the Bible says Peter was restored in his position because he waited on the grace of his Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So there's a problem when we want to do everything on our own. This issue of self-righteousness, which is coupled with some element of pride. Bazan, what should be our response instead? And I want us to look at someone who we should look up to in some ways in terms of what they did when they saw the love of God in their lives. I want us to look at the sinful woman that is found in the book of Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, we are going to read verse 36 to verse 38. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of pregnant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Just hold it there for a second. We know the story, we've spoken about it before. But there are a few things I want us to, to emphasize this morning. Bazarane, here is a, a situation, a real life situation that actually happened. Jesus is invited into a Pharisee's house. I presume this Pharisee, when he invited Jesus, maybe there were certain things he wanted to ask him. And while they are, after they've had dinner, Bazarane, here comes a sinful woman that the Bible says, was known in the city, Bazaar. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sin. In other words, everyone in town knew that this woman was a sin. I live as a So uh, we sometimes even give these people names in the townships. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. When there's a specific lady that you know, that this lady, uh, free for all, Never said, you know what I'm talking about. Or yeah. well, you want me to say it straight? Yeah. I must keep it like this now. <laughs> we even give them names, Bazaar. And she's that type of a lady who has known that this one, she's a very generous lady, this one. Yeah. Extremely generous. Her name is Nomusa. I never said. That's her name. Never. 
That's what she's known. She's known in the township as her. I was going to say a surname, but the surname is going to be not appropriate for the church. So I'm, I'll leave. I will leave the surname. I will also leave the stars and so called. If you want me to tell you, I can tell you after church. <laughs> if you are naughty like me, never say. <clears throat> so this lady was on the camps. And then you can imagine, this is a lady that's known. She's got a reputation. And Jesus is reclining on a chair after supper. And this lady comes. And Rosanna, I don't think we start to understand. She starts touching Jesus' feet and massaging them. This lady that we know, she's a problem. She starts playing with the feet of the master. What is the natural thing that comes to mind? Ukali <laughs> that's that's, That is the natural response to this situation. Is that not the case, Baza? Yeah. That's what you would think. What is this one doing with our, with our men of God? Are you with me, Baza? This is the picture of what is happening here. She starts to come. She starts to wipe the feet of Jesus Christ. People are looking at this and saying, nine is thrown at. What is happening around us? Are you with me, Baza? Let's read the verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is, who is touching him, for she is a sinner. This lady is busy, Bazala. She's busy massaging the feet of the master. And the host... The host doesn't speak up, but inside himself, he's thinking. You know, sometimes, Mr. Bazaar, whenever you're hosting people, you don't say everything that you think. Any person. Something you just keep quiet and you say, hmm, this one. So he's thinking to himself, if this man was truly a prophet, so he's questioning the anointing of Jesus because Jesus is allowing himself to be touched by the sinful. He said, if he knew, what kind, if he was a prophet, he would know. For sure, he would know. What does it mean? Therefore, he's not a prophet. How can the man of God be touched by such? So one day when you see me walking with an unrighteous woman, as a, someone, man, someone, <laughs> when you see me walking with an unrighteous woman, remember this verse. <laughs> I'm ministering to them. I'm not trying to... Are you with me, Baza? You must remember this verse. Hey, you're serious. What's going on? You are like me when I became born again. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is the picture that this man has in his mind. You can't be a man of God. Surely, there's a problem with your anointing. Continue turn to verse 40. And verse 42. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Mm. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? One of the things I want you to start noticing, Bazaar, in this verse, when Jesus recognizes what this man is thinking in his mind, he wants to address the problem. And he addresses the problem through a story. Never said. Mm -hmm. And then he starts to say to him, look, there are two people. There's a certain creditor who had two debtors. So there were two people who owed him money. One owed 500 and the other owed 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, and that's what I want you to notice, these two people have got no way that they can pay this debt. Just like us and our righteousness. And our, they've got no way to pay this debt on their own. This man freely forgives them. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Freely he forgives them of their debt. And then he asks the question, out of these two, out of these two, which of them will love him more? Continue turn to verse 43. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Mm. And 
And he said to him, you have rightly judged. So what he is saying is, out of these two people, the one owes 500, the one owes 50. You forgive them both. Who will love you more? Not the one who owed more. Are you with me, sir? So what does this mean? The one who is forgiven more. Are we together, sir? The one who is forgiven more is the one that loves more. Read the verse again for us, time. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. So what is Jesus saying, Bazaar? Maybe, maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself. But she's saying the person loves because they have been forgiven more. It's in the past tense, Bazaar. Mm -hmm. They love the master because they have been forgiven. Are we together, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. Right. Continue, read verse 44 to 47. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? Yes. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. Mm. But she, was, she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Mm. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Mm. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Wow. Ut Bazarugu, verse 47. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Remember, Bazaar, what did Jesus say? The one who loves much is one who has been forgiven much. So what Jesus is trying to say, that what you are seeing this woman doing, she's doing what she's doing because she realizes that she has been forgiven much. That is why she's doing so much more for me. Nina, Nina ever since I came here, you've done nothing for me because you don't realize how much you have been forgiven. Are we together, Bazaar? So this woman's response, so what I think had happened is somewhere she had met Jesus somewhere. And Jesus forgave her sins, as sinful as she was. She realized this man loves me so much, even with all of my filth, even with all of my righteousness, I want to do something for him. So what Jesus is saying, she's doing this because she loves much, because she recognizes that she has been forgiven much. You see, Bazana, this is what the love of God does for us. When you recognize how much God loves you, you know what your response will be? Your response will be, if I am loved so much, then I have to stop sinning. If I am loved so much, then I have to stop the wrong that is in my life. Because it's the love of God that is at work in you. And, and, and let me tell you this. This is what I was sharing with, with my family earlier this week. What we don't realize when we reject this message of, the, of, the, of grace and of the gospel, we actually don't realize that the requirements of the gospel are actually of a higher standard. And let me try and explain what I mean, Mazar. When you have been forgiven all of your sins, past, present, and future, because of the finished work of the cross, when you know that you have been forgiven and you know that you are loved, I put a question to them. When we were sharing this week, I said if you were a king and you had subjects, we know what subjects are in the present. So as a king, you have people that are under you. I asked them a question when we were sharing this week. I said if you were a king, tell me which kind of people you would like to serve under you or to be your subjects. And I said, I know the kingdom of God is a kingdom of sons. There are no subjects in the kingdom of God. But I'm using human terms so that you can understand what I'm trying to explain. If you were a king and you had subjects, and you had two groups, you have a group that listen and do what you want because they know that whatever they do, you won't find fault with them. And you've got another group that only serve you because they are afraid of you, because they know that if they don't do right, you will kill them. Who would you like to serve you? 
Do you want people ministering to you because they fear you? Because they know that if they don't do right, there's going to be punishment. Versus people who even when they know that their sins are forgiven, they say, I want to live right. They say, I want to please my master. I know that I'm forgiven. I'm not dealing with a sin problem. But because he loved me so much, I want to do right by him. Which one would you choose? But then it's a higher standard. When we recognize the love of God for our lives, we stop sinning because we want to stop sinning. You know, I always use this example. And I say, I don't want my wife to submit to me. I want her to want to submit to me. Do you get the difference, Baza? Mm -hmm. I just don't want her to submit to me because I beat her, because she says I'm abusive, because I abuse her. <laughs> I don't want her to, to respond to me because I'm abusive. I want her to do it because she wants to. There's a big difference, Baza. There's a huge difference. And this is the standard of grace where we say we renounce all our sinful ways, where we say we, walk, we renounce all our shameful deeds. We will follow the Lord because we recognize how much he has loved us. Amen. Amen. And that's when you start to fall in love with him. That's when the sin starts to fall off from your life because you realize how much you love. But then I, 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 I'll use this example time and time again. When a man goes out there to the world and he sees all of these other beautiful women, one of the reasons why a man won't cheat is because he knows how much his wife loves him. Are you with me, Bazaar? Okay. He will say, how can I do this to my putsunun? <laughs> how can I do this to two? How can I do this to the one who loves me so much? That is what the love of God does. But do you understand why the reason why Joseph did not sin in a foreign country? He said, how can I do this thing to God? Because he had a love relationship with the Lord. And that is what we are missing. We give people all sorts of rules without letting them interact with the love of God. But then I want to submit to you. When you see the power of grace and the power of love and the power of what God has done in your life, then it automatically starts to change you. You know, when I started to embrace this message of grace, reading the word became a joy. You know, sir, I know that some of you read the word because I say you must read it. <laughs> Not because you want to. Mufundi said we are reading Romans chapter 7 today. It's not a joy. But then when you start to embrace, when you realize how much you are loved. You want to spend more time in the things of God. It works in you. The love of God works in you. Not you loving him. You will fail time and time. You need to start recognizing the love of God for you. And that is what will change you. Now I don't struggle with reading the word. Now I don't struggle with all of those things that I used to struggle with. Because I recognize how much I am loved. And when sin wants to come and knock at my door, I say, when Jesus Christ paid such a heavy price for me, how can I betray him? The, the, the Bible says the love of God constrains us. It is the thing that makes us not to sin when we realize how much we are loved. Not when we are, not when we are told a bunch of rules. Instead, the rules make you find a way to sin. The children of Israel, when they left Egypt, they never created a golden calf until they received the law. Only when they received the law did they start sinning. But then I want to get Amen. it is my prayer that the love of God may become a reality to you. What Christ has done. You know, Bazalan, that I now start to understand when it comes to praise and worship, the songs that touch me the most are the songs that talk about the love of God towards us. You know, like this song, Dr. Tumi, Love on the Cross. Hey, they know at home how many times I cry when that song is played. Because I recognize his love for me. I recognize that he paid a price that I could not pay 
Bazala. And he took upon himself a debt which he did not owe. That is my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is why I love him so. It is my prayer that that same love may be shared abroad in your hearts. Because I am telling you, when you start to see how much he loves you, your life will automatically change. No one will have to tell you any rule. No one will have to tell you, don't do this, don't do that. Your love for him will change you. Let us bow our heads. Our faithful Father, mighty Redeemer, we thank you and honor you for this time. We thank you for this word that was delivered in this place today. We pray, God, for your glorious light to shine upon us and to be revealed more and more in our lives as we see the grace, as we see the power of your love when you died for us on the cross. Without sin, accepted all insults, accepted all condemnation, strife, all the sin was upon you. That in God's sin you took upon yourself. We thank you that you did this because you loved us. We thank you that we love you because you loved us first. Let the reality of your love go to become a manifestation in our lives so that it can change our paths. We honor and we bless you and we cherish you. And we pray for all of these things in the mighty and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.